Today's webinar is brought to you by CT and Hunt and Williams. Today's speaker is Scott Kempel. Scott is a partner with Hunt and Williams. Thank you, Scott. Uh, and, and thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. Uh, our topic is on public company governance issues, uh, which could easily be an all-day or an all-week uh, subject. Uh, I've tried to pick, uh, for the course of the next hour, a series of topics that are uh, perhaps of most interest or, uh, or pick up some of the current events that we're reading about in the Wall Street Journal or certainly that our clients are coming to us with. Um, and because it is focused on public companies. I'm going to talk mostly today about the SEC uh, and various SEC regulations, but we will also talk a little bit about Delaware and some of the Delaware rules um, from time to time. So I'll start with just a, a basic introduction to the SEC, and I, I know from the attendance list that many of you are, are, are seasoned securities lawyers and um, probably know all this, but just to level set with, with, with those uh, attending who may not be, uh, the SEC was founded uh, in 1934 under a statute that most of us are familiar with called the Securities Exchange Act of 1934. Uh, interestingly enough, the first federal securities law came out in 1933. Uh, and from 1933 to 1934, the Federal Trade Commission was the securities regulator in the United States. Uh, but now we have the Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, they've been in business now for 80 years. Uh, most of us uh, interact with them through the Division of Corporation Finance, uh, which oversees public companies. But the SEC has a much broader mission. Uh, they also oversee investment advisors, pooled investment funds like mutual funds. Uh, under Dodd-Frank, they have enhanced authority to, to police the activity activities of uh, private equity funds, hedge funds, and other kinds of unregistered uh, 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 pool, pools of capital, um, as well as their traditional role overseeing broker-dealers, securities exchanges, and the securities markets. Uh, when people talk about the commission, there actually is a commission of five people. Uh, each of them is appointed uh, by the president with the advice and consent of the Senate. They serve staggered terms so that, in theory, there's a new commissioner rolling on and off each year. Uh, June is usually when the term starts and ends. Uh, a little bit of historical uh, interest, the very first chairman of the SEC was Joseph Kennedy Sr., who uh, ended up, of course, being the father of President Kennedy and, and uh, uh, is famous for a lot of other reasons as well. Um, and the SEC, most notably, is only a civil law enforcement agency. I think a lot of people sometimes wonder why, um, you know, particularly when you hear about uh, securities frauds or, or market uh, issues, why more people people don't go to jail, and why the SEC isn't prosecuting them. Well, the, the, the short answer is the SEC has no criminal authority. Uh, now, they do coordinate with the, uh, the criminal authorities. They coordinate with the FBI and the Department of Justice. But to prove criminal securities fraud, you have to prove that the, 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 the uh, defendant had, had knowledge uh, of what he or she was doing. Um, and you have to prove that by uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. It's the same as any other criminal case. Um, the SEC, though, in its, in its civil litigation, uh, doesn't need to satisfy that high standard. Uh, it can be clear and convincing evidence or other lower standards, depending on the nature of the offense. Some, some of the SEC regulations are, uh, by the way, only require strict liability or negligence, so you also don't have to satisfy that knowledge requirement. Uh, and finally, uh, all public companies are subject to the SEC's uh, jurisdiction. Most companies are, that are public become public by doing a public offering, but there are some companies out there that are public by virtue of the fact that they have a certain number of shareholders and a certain number of assets. So that's just a very brief over, overview of the SEC. Now we'll wade into some of the more substantive issues. The first one I thought I'd start with is, is cybersecurity. Um, you know, it, it, not a day goes by now that we're not reading in the press about a uh, a data breach at a, at a, at a well-known company, whether it's a bank or a retailer or uh, some other company that's that's well-known to the public. Um, and you know, admittedly, m most of those issues concern law enforcement and uh, concern uh, data security, which are, are outside the strict uh, mission of the SEC. Um, 
but there can be disclosure issues that come out of it, and that's, that's often how the SEC seeks to regulate these issues is through the use of disclosure. And, uh, you know, in theory, a, a data breach could uh, be an event that could have material implications for a company. It could materially impact its financial statements. It could materially impact its reputation. It could materially impact its relationship with customers. It could lead to regulatory investigations by other regulators. And all of these things are the sorts of topics that uh, the Federal Security Securities laws uh, uh, are concerned about in the sense that investors have to know about material developments at companies. So uh, what the SEC staff did a few years ago um, is release some guidance in the form of questions and answers um, uh, about how do the federal securities laws uh, apply uh, in the disclosure context to a cybersecurity or, or, or data breach issue. And the, the staff guidance took the tone, you know, not surprisingly, of, look, there are a number of regulations already on the books that require disclosures about significant events in the life cycle of a company. There are already existing requirements that concern descriptions of its business, risks to that business, discussion of its financial affairs, um, uh, the requirement to report uh, financial results, to require to report material litigation. And each of these things, uh, for example, can be triggered if there's a data breach. And so, uh, and going through some, some hypothetical examples, uh, the staff guidance listed typical topics that m might be worthy of disclosure. I've listed some of them here. So, for example, um, what types of, what aspects of your operations give rise to material cyber risk? If you're a retailer, that might mean uh, the, the, the point of sale terminals where uh, credit card information is often stolen. Um, if, if you're a banking organization, that might include ATM machines or uh, online merchant transactions. Uh, another item is what are the potential consequences and costs of cyber incidents. So, uh, you know, hypothetically speaking, you've had a breach. Uh, it's going to cost so many million dollars to remediate. Um, we anticipate that it's going to affect our results in this way or that way. That's the sort of information that could be disclosable. What's the company's response plan? Um, you know, this, this is also an issue that uh, a lot of other regulators, uh, you know, particularly when they're talking about consumer protection, are concerned about. Uh, and the SEC is not trying to regulate that substantive content, but, but just pro require disclosure around well, what the response plan is, if it's material. And finally, whether the company has experienced a breach. Um, now, this is obviously a delicate subject because uh, you don't want to have disclosure that's so detailed or so specific that uh, it allows a future ha a hacker to, to replicate uh, what a prior one has done. And so the SEC has, has made it clear that you're not required to provide a roadmap of the company's vulnerabilities. But it, if materially you are required to make disclosure around these other areas. Um, this has been an area that some of the commissioners have also been interested in. Uh, Commissioner Aguilar, for example, gave a speech recently um, where he said that it's incumbent on boards to, to, to monitor these situations. Now, technically speaking, the SEC has no authority to govern the, the, the fiduciary activities of the board of directors, um, but it is, it is important because it's one more public official that's noted this issue. Um, an increasing trend we're also seeing is uh, after significant breaches, is uh, the plaintiff's bar emerges. Uh, we've seen it with, with companies like Target, for example, and all the sorts of shareholder litigation and fiduciary litigation that you might expect um, in other situations that are familiar to public companies, drop in stock price, bad announcement, those sorts of things. Uh, the plaintiff's bar is taking that playbook and, and, and running it against the data breach, and they often allege that the board, for example, has not been monitoring operations properly or that they've been violating other fiduciary duties and uh, you know, then you're off to the races for, with shareholder litigation. Um, and the proxy advisory firms that we'll talk about some later uh, today have also taken an interest in this issue. And we saw, again, for example, at Target, uh, ISS, which is the dominant uh, proxy advisory firm, recommended a vote against most of the directors at the most recent uh, uh, annual meeting because the allegation was that they had not been appropriately monitoring cybersecurity. Now, um, in hindsight, all those directors were reelected, and so there's a question as to whether, uh, in this particular case, ISS's recommendation uh, was, was, was compelling. But I think we're going to continue to see this, and this is going to continue to be a risk for, for companies as we go forward. 
Another area that um, has been uh, continues to be in the news is the issue of climate change. And uh, on the one hand, the SEC has not been overly aggressive in pushing its agenda on this, but on the other hand, they did back in 2010 do some interpretive guidance that's still on the books and that companies still have to pay attention to. And um, you know, you're increasingly seeing uh, NGO and activist groups seizing on that to say that companies should be doing more in this space. So um, uh, not, not too different than the cybersecurity uh, guidance we just discussed. Uh, the climate change guidance said, look, there are existing regulations under Regulation SK and other, other principles of disclosure about companies, and under appropriate facts, uh, changes in climate could affect your business, and that may in turn uh, be disclosable events for your uh, investors. They especially wanted you to focus on uh, the company's liquidity, its capital resources, its results of operations. Some of the topics might include pending legislation, uh, indirect risks to the business, physical impacts. Um, you know, some examples they, they gave, for example, are you know, could your company profit from selling emissions credits? Uh, would you uh, see a change in demand for your products and services based on climate change? Uh, somewhat controversially, what reputational damage could the company uh, undergo? Could you see increased demand for green products and services? Well, there might actually be a benefit uh, that the company could see from this, and on and on. Um, you know, when the when the guidance first came out, it was somewhat controversial. It was it was voted on by a party line split among the commissioners. Uh, the commissioners are technically Democrats or Republicans uh, under under the 34 Act. Um, you usually don't see the sort of partisan rank you see in Congress. Uh, at the SEC, we're not talking about issues of gun control or abortion or other things of that sort that can be very polarizing. Uh, but but this is one where the commissioners split. Um, what has the the SEC staff been doing? Uh, you know that's that's always an important question for public companies in terms of their disclosure. Um, you would expect to have seen a, a significant uptick in comment letters from the SEC staff. Uh, questioning companies' disclosure practices or, or, or encouraging them to disclose more. But for the most part, we haven't seen that. And there's been um, a handful each year over the last four years. Um, but, but certainly, it's not a, uh, it doesn't seem from the staff's perspective to be a, a critical issue. Um, you know, a lot of companies have increased some of their disclosure around these topics, uh, particularly on risk factors. Um, but, but importantly, there have not been any actual SEC enforcement cases where the enforcement division has actually pursued a company uh, on the grounds that their disclosures were uh, inadequate. We'll, we'll talk more about some other enforcement cases uh, uh, later in the program. Um, but this is an area where, again, a lot of social and environmental investors, a lot of NGO groups do have an interest in these issues, and they're continuing to push companies for, for enhanced disclosure. Um, and maybe that's a good segue to the broader topic of uh, ESG disclosure. Uh, ESG is a, is a a crude acronym for environmental, social, and governance disclosure. Um, and as the slide says, it reflects the demands of uh, socially responsible activist investors. These folks tend to have a broad range of agendas, and uh, they're not monolithic. They, they don't necessarily speak with one voice. Some are focused just on governance issues. Some are just focused on environmental issues. Some are focused on social implications like supply chain or, or human rights of, of workers. Um, sometimes they form uh, 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 working groups or work very closely together. In other cases, they, they work independently. Um, but they are increasingly becoming a force to be reckoned with. And um, some of it is, is lobbying for changes in statutes and regulations. We'll talk a little bit about the conflict minerals rules in a minute. That's an area where the, this, this crowd claims victory and is, is, as a matter of law, required companies to make disclosures that they might not otherwise care to make. Um, uh, but even without even without the power of law, a lot of companies are becoming increasingly responsive uh, on a voluntary basis. And we'll talk we'll talk some about sustainability reporting and, and related issues um, uh, shortly. Um, and one force in particular that that um, has been very powerful here is there is a recent trend towards sustainability reporting. Um, uh, through accounting standards, and there's a group called the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. It loosely models itself uh, after the Financial Accounting Standards Board, which is an actual regulator. SASB has no legal authority, but they have increasingly been recruiting very prominent 
um, uh, officials to, to be on their board and to be advisors to them. They have a very well organized uh, apparatus for publishing uh, proposed standards, and uh, you know the next step is to seek to require that these things be enacted into law. So uh, that, that's a group that I think we'll all be watching uh, in the coming years. So. I talked a little bit earlier about conflict minerals reporting. Um, you know, if you're a public company, uh, or even if you're not, but you're a supplier to a public company, you've probably gone through this drill over the last year. Um, just briefly, conflict minerals are the three T's, tin, tantal, and the tungsten. Uh, as well as gold. Uh, this was a provision that was uh, snuck into the Dodd-Frank Act, as, as were a large number of other provisions that objectively had nothing to do with the financial crisis, but there was a convenient opportunity for uh, uh, certain forces to get their pet, pet projects enacted into law. This one is meant to uh, address what is admittedly a horrible humanitarian situation in, in Africa and in, in, the, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, which has for the last several decades been torn by civil war, uh, anarchy, and, and, and currently a barely functioning government. Uh, as it turns out, this is a country that is somewhat wealthy in, in terms of natural resources and minerals, and various warring factions have been using um, and smuggling those resources in a way to fund their operations, which which continues to contribute to the humanitarian crisis there. Uh, the purpose behind the rules was to require disclosures of uh, by public companies of uh, the, their use of conflict minerals in the supply chain. Um, and you know the, the the jury is out as to whether these rules have made any real effect uh, on the ground in Africa, uh, but nonetheless they do create a whole new compliance requirement for public companies, and ultimately that that compliance is reflected in the filing of a document called a Form SD. It's due each year on May 31st. Uh, it requires that the company discuss its so-called reasonable country of origin inquiry into uh, its supply chain to determine if 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 these uh, uh, conflict minerals are, are 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 part of their products and are necessary to the functionality or production of those products. And then, if so, um, uh, there's additional disclosure required about uh, the sourcing of those products, uh, which what, what smelters they came from, and those sorts of uh, bits of information. Uh, a number of trade groups have been challenging these rules before the courts. Uh, they had some some limited success before the D.C. Circuit earlier this year, uh, who uh, turned down a challenge on a number of grounds, but but did take issue with uh, some of the reporting requirements on First Amendment grounds. But, uh, the statute and the rules require companies to ultimately put themselves into one bucket or another, whether they're uh, so-called DRC conflict-free or not, uh, or DRC conflict undeterminable. Um, the, the, the DC Circuit uh, uh, took issue with that from a First Amendment perspective, in the sense that it's a compelled disclosure um, that doesn't satisfy the various uh, uh, Supreme Court precedents on those those kinds of issues. Um, the SEC responded by saying, "Okay, you've got to comply with all the rules, but you just don't have to put yourself in one of those buckets." Uh, so companies uh, were required to make their filings on time. Um, more recently, over the summer, the D.C. Circuit uh, en banc, uh, that is to say all the, all the judges uh, hearing a particular case uh, on another f food labeling uh, uh, issue, uh, issued a ruling that perhaps calls into question the earlier ruling on conflict minerals. Um, a number of parties have sought uh, rehearing on banc or rehearing uh, by the original panel in light of the, the uh, other opinion that came out this summer. So we'll continue to follow that case. Um, in the meantime, though, the rules are on the books and they, they do have their impact. Uh, we'll discuss that impact um, uh, from a reporting perspective in just a moment. But uh, as the operator suggested, uh, for those of you that are seeking CLE, we, we have to uh, uh, pause and take a minute to make sure that you're all paying attention. Um, and we'll do that three or four times throughout the presentation uh, in the form of uh, this polling question. So you can see here, it's a very simple question. Um, it's a yes or no question. All these are yes or no questions. And we'll give you just a moment to click yes or no so that the, uh, the CLE system can register your participation. Um, and then we'll go on uh, in just a moment and uh, see what the polling results are. 
Okay, so did your company file a Form SD? Um, uh, we've got a, about a quarter saying yes and three quarters saying no. Um, that's interesting because as we move on to the next slide, um, we'll talk about some of the trends that, that we found in the first round of filings that were made. Um, so uh, the first thing we found was that uh, approximately 1,300 companies uh, filed a Form SD. Um, the SEC estimated about 6,000 would. That's out of a total of 9,000 public companies. Um, so you know, just like our audience, uh, it's a it's a minority filed. I think that's true across uh, companies uh, more broadly. Uh, as you might expect, industries that have a high Form SD filing rate are those that are traditional manufacturers who, who might actually produce products that could contain conflict minerals. They include things like retailers and automotive companies and aerospace companies, electronics companies, that sort of thing. Um, on the other hand, industries with a low Form SD rate tended to be more on the service side or, or the financial side where they don't uh, produce uh, traditional widgets uh, and, and traditional products, and thus I mean, there's, there's, there's nothing that they manufacture. That includes industries like banking and healthcare and insurance and telecommunications and food and grocery and um, even airlines. And you might pause and look at airlines for a second and say, well, wait a second, you know, these airlines fly around a lot of airplanes, and those airplanes obviously have a lot of conflict minerals in them, um, or at least a lot of metal, uh, at least. And the way the rules work is uh, Boeing or Airbus or whoever the manufacturer of those airplanes um, would be required to report on it, but the ultimate purchaser of that product, um, generally speaking, is, is not required to report. Uh, of the companies that filed, of the 1,300 or so companies that filed, um, more than half had a market capitalization over $1 billion. So uh, that is to say that uh, a significant number of these filers were, were larger companies, and smaller companies perhaps were not uh, at least required to, to make a filing. Uh, when we look at the actual filings themselves, there are some interesting uh, uh, observations of what exactly call them trends. Um, but, but one of them is that uh, some companies had a combined reasonable country of origin inquiry narrative uh, as well as a due diligence narrative. Uh, the, the, some others split that uh, two ways, and there's, the rules are somewhat ambiguous as to whether you can do it that way or not. Um, in a recent speech, uh, uh, Keith Higgins, who's the director of the Division of Corporation Finance at the SEC, suggested that some companies were conflating uh, the requirement, didn't give a lot more uh, guidance in terms of what exactly he meant. Um, but uh, you know, I expect in future years that we'll, we'll see some more on this. Um, there was really not a lot of uniformity in the re reporting the due diligence results themselves. Uh, you know, some of that's because the the constitutionally infirm descriptors uh, that the court struck down were not required to be used. Um, we saw some companies using that terminology nonetheless. Uh, some saying nothing. Some using their own terminology to sort of imply that they can't figure it out or that they were undeterminable. Uh, and, and that really was the, 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 the true trend here is that most companies simply weren't able to figure out the country of origin uh, of, of these conflict minerals. Uh, a common complaint we saw in the reports as well as our own experience helping companies prepare these is that it's hard to get this information. And you know, most companies, uh, the only visibility they have in their supply chain is through their suppliers. And their suppliers, in turn, can't figure this information out. So um, you know, ultimately, um, uh, if you don't have any data coming up the, the, the supply chain, it's hard to report out where, where these things come from. Uh, there are only a handful of companies that actually claim that they were conflict-free, and this got, thus got the audit that's required by the regulations. There's, there's four of them uh, in total, um, uh, two somewhat well-known, two somewhat uh, lesser-known. I think in the coming year, um, we're going to continue to see the NGO community uh, putting pressure on this issue. Uh, I don't think it's going to be a huge area of SEC enforcement. Uh, I'm not even sure we'll get any more guidance from the SEC. Certainly I don't think we'll hear anything until the D.C. Circuit sort of solves itself and issues some final definitive opinion or or not. Um, uh, I, I think now that we have a number of filings on record, people are going to be pouring through them to look for best practices as, as securities lawyers are, are want to do. Um, the benchmarking is a, is a common thing you do when you have your own filing. You see what other companies have said, and if you like the way they said it, you sort of copy it. I think we'll see some of that in the coming year. Um, 
I think we'll see the NGOs and some of the other groups that have an interest in these issues continue to issue their own guidance. You know, in some of my discussions with the NGO community, um, a number of expressed concern to me about the, a lot of the the sort of sandbagging language that was was common in these reports. That uh, you know, this is a difficult task, and we can't really figure it out, and we can't really provide a lot of guidance or comfort or assurance and and. I think the NGOs prefer just not to see that. Um, you know, as an attorney, though, I think I would caution companies against taking it out because these things are subject to liability, after all, under the securities laws. Um, but two other areas that I think the NGOs want to see probably do make some sense. One is they'd like to see more uh, on the process that companies followed as part of their diligence. Um, you know, most companies follow the OECD guidelines, which are really the only ones out there. Um, but they'd like to see some more detail on how that got put together. And finally, I think they'd like to see more information on on the actual list of smelters and refineries, at least to the extent that uh, companies can can figure that out. Uh, reports next year will be due on June 1st. Um, uh, ordinarily, it would be May 31st, but that, that will be a Sunday next year, so uh, you get one extra day. Uh, another issue that, that starts getting attention about this time of year, um, just through the operation of the calendar, are, are shareholder proposals. Um, the SEC has a rule called Rule 14A8 that permits any shareholder who really held a nominal amount of securities, $2,000 in voting securities, and has held them for one year, uh, to submit a, a proposal for inclusion in the company's proxy statement. And there are some some limits on the length of the proposal and the eligibility requirements. Um, but this this becomes an issue for companies uh, as we get to the end of the year because you have to have sufficient time to, to vet it with the SEC and uh, include it in your uh, Included in your proxy statement next year, and that in turn uh, works through your advance notice bylaw mechanism. So these start trickling in uh, during the fourth quarter of the year. Uh, who submits these kinds of proposals? They, there's a small um, small group of uh, gadflies that, that tend to be the ones that dominate this process. Um, this is mostly retail activism uh, in the sense that uh, hedge funds and, and other managers of significant sums of money don't really engage in this kind of activism. We'll talk a little bit about the more substantive engagement that they actually uh, do concern themselves with. Um, and if you've ever gotten one of these letters from a proponent, you'll know that there's a bit of a kabuki dance. You, you, you crack the regulations, you see if it's excludable on some technical grounds. Perhaps the shareholder didn't own the shares long enough or produced insufficient evidence of ownership. Perhaps they are covering a, one of the handful of topics that the SEC has set as off limits. Um, uh, if that's not the case, then you can submit a letter to the SEC staff and, and ask them to weigh in and, and sort of mediate whether it goes in or not. And um, they're just as likely to exclude a proposal as they are to include one. So uh, that's often not a very satisfactory outcome for a lot of companies. Um, in some cases, you can, you, well, in all cases, you can go to federal court and ask a court to issue some sort of injunctive relief. Uh, that's been gaining some traction with a handful of companies. Um, after some initial successes in the last year, there are a number of courts that weren't particularly sympathetic to uh, the companies. So I think some, some are starting to, to rethink whether that's a sound uh, strategy or not. Um, and you know, once again, the most popular topics are the ones that I, I talked about a few minutes ago. It's the ESG topics, um, and we see proposals on, on a whole range of issues, but they might include things like issuing enhanced sustainability reports, curbing greenhouse gas emissions, um, more in the governance sphere, separating the chairman and CEO, majority voting and direct director elections, and, and on and on and on. Uh, these proposals, at the end of the day, generally don't tend to garner majority votes. But the SEC continues to get them, and uh, they process three to 400 requests from companies every year seeking to exclude these. Um, and there's a lot more that don't get challenged and, and go either into the proxy statement without a fight, or um, companies just say, all right, you know what, we don't even need a shareholder proposal. We'll voluntarily do whatever you're asking, and maybe that's issuing a report. Maybe that's changing a governance mechanism. Maybe that's doing something else. But this continues to be a... Uh, an area where uh, companies will have to deal with this for the foreseeable future. Uh, we have another one of these polling questions for uh, CLE purposes, so I'll, I'll give you just a moment to check yes or no as to whether your company has received one of these proposals in the last five years. All right, let's see what the uh, 
results are. Uh, again, interestingly, uh, yes, about a quarter of the time, no, about three quarters of the time. Um, uh, these proposals, in my experience, tend to be focused at larger companies, the Fortune 500, the Fortune 1000. Um, they seem to be less focused on smaller companies. Um, uh, but if you haven't received one, consider yourself lucky because they can be uh, very irksome to deal with. Um, so I'll talk just briefly again about sustainability reporting. Um, you know, I've, I've mentioned a little bit now what, what these reports often look like and what topics they tend to, to cover. At this point, there's not a lot of SEC regulations that actually require the production of these kinds of reports. So instead, companies are generally doing them voluntarily in a way to be responsive to shareholders or to be responsive to customers or, or just to show that the company is, 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 is a green company or is otherwise concerned about uh, these sorts of issues. Um, and, and that's fine. That's, 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 that's the nature of private ordering. Companies can choose how to respond to these things. Uh, where I could get interested in them from a securities law perspective is that uh, there, are, there are rules on, uh, on making material misstatements to the markets and to the public, and we'll talk a little bit about 10b-5-1, um, or sorry, just 10b-5 in a minute. Um, but one of the things I found is that these reports tend to be prepared in a silo outside the silo of folks that actually – uh, review your securities filings. So they're not reviewed by your finance team often. They're not reviewed by your securities lawyers, whether it's in-house or, or outside the company. And some of these reports include some pretty bold statements, um, which I think sooner or later, uh, these kinds of reports are going to be the subject of litigation. Uh, again, on the grounds that uh, you said your carbon footprint was X. We actually think it was 100 times X. Um, we believe that's materially misleading to the market um, for one reason or another, and thus we're, we're suing you. Um, and uh, you know, there's, in, in some sense, there's no way to prevent those kinds of cases other than to just carefully scrub these reports and put them into the cycle of everything else. Treat it like any other disclosure you're making to investors. Most companies have a process where investor communications get vetted very carefully, uh, much more carefully than a routine advertisement or, or, or some other um, uh, marketing piece. And um, this is the sort of thing that can and, and uh, one day will lead to liability for some companies. So uh, get on top of it now and, and get your securities counsel and, and the other folks who are uh, regularly participate in the preparation of your SEC documents start looking at these things uh, to make sure that they, they satisfy the, the, the standards of disclosure that you would make to investors in other contexts. Um, speaking of public disclosure, uh, we'll talk a little bit about Regulation FD now. Um, this has been on the books since 2000, so it's, it's, it's not a new regulation. Um, this is the one that is intended to uh, limit uh, uh, selective disclosure to analysts or, or other third parties. Uh, FDA stands for fair disclosure. Uh, and the crux of the regulation, of course, there's lots of provisos and, and exceptions, but the crux of it is that no covered person, that's your directors, your executive officers, or your investor relations personnel, are allowed to disclose material non-public information to market professionals like stock uh, analysts or financial analysts or to, or to security holders or investors themselves unless that information is made public simultaneously. And you know, the way most public companies deal with this is if they're going to do um, an earnings call, they'll, they'll allow the public to dial in and they'll simultaneously uh, publish online uh, the, the substance of whatever that uh, uh, discussion will be. They'll often file an 8K as well. And it covers a number of different topics. We've uh, listed a few of them on this slide. There are exemptions. You know, you can talk to the news media uh, during public offerings in your roadshow. You can make certain communications that you ordinarily wouldn't otherwise be permitted to do. And uh, the regulation was never intended to interfere with your sort of ordinary course business communications with your customers, your suppliers, your vendors, etc. Where I think it gets interesting is the SEC has brought 14 enforcement cases since 2000. So on average, that's about one a year. Um, and you know they don't necessarily come like clockwork once every 12 months, but um, the, the enforcement division, in many contexts, and this is one of them, likes to send message cases. The theory is, look, we can't be everywhere all the time. We can't 
we can't get every violation that's out there, but if we bring one or two of these a year to remind folks that we're paying attention, it'll scare everyone else and they'll self-police. And that's, that's often the way it works out. Um, uh, about a year ago, the, the, the SEC brought a, a, an action against the company called First Solar. Uh, that one's notable because what you had was the, the, the vice president of investor relations basically going rogue and uh, knowing uh, that certain information was untrue and that certain government grants were not coming, but continuing to tell the market uh, uh, information to the contrary. And um, as word started getting out that the information was untrue, start having these sidebar conversations on a one-off basis to sort of continue to try and do damage control and, and, and really only made things worse. Um, so he, he was sanctioned and the company filed, fired him and he was also the subject of the SEC enforcement action. Uh, the, the company itself, as soon as it learned about this, immediately uh, jumped into action, self-reported to the SEC, and, and took a number of other um, uh, uh, measures to try and uh, correct all this. And so the SEC didn't charge them, uh, you know, as, as a reward for their cooperation and their handling this appropriately. And that's that's also one of the messages that comes out of a case like this: that um, uh, sandbagging and digging your heels in, and you know, trying to pretend that nothing happened or trying to cover it up uh, is often not the best. Way way to, to handle these sorts of delicate disclosure situations. Uh, what, um, what we'll do now is go to uh, yet another polling question. Um, just briefly, uh, does your company have a regulation FD policy? If you're a private company, you don't need one. Uh, if you're a public company, you, you probably do have one. Uh, it, it may not be explicit. It may be built into your broader code of conduct or media policy or uh, something of that sort. But we'll give everyone just another second to uh, click the box. And uh, looks like the, uh, <laughs> uh, the results were put here before the polling question, so let me move there. And then I'll just all there we go. There's the results. It's about 50-50. That may reflect that we have some uh, private companies on the phone. Another interesting area, though, um, you know, of course, in 2000, when those rules on Reg FD were passed, we uh, it seems like ancient history. When I, certainly, when I try and explain it to my kids that we didn't have iPhones back then, or Facebook, or social media, uh, but all those things are now um, ubiquitous. And you know, how do you handle? Uh, social media and other kinds of uh, disclosure in the Reg FD world. And this issue came to a head a couple of years ago um, with, with Netflix. And the CEO of Netflix uh, had, a, had a personal Facebook page. He had hundreds of followers, thousands of followers, including s several members of the, of the press. And he would go out there and, and, and make certain posts about the company. The one that, that got him in some trouble was a post that said, monthly viewing exceeded 1 billion hours for the first time ever in June. And it's debatable whether that's material information or not. Um, but the SEC seized on this, commenced an investigation, and uh, rather than suing him or, or the company, they took kind of a middle ground, and Section 21A of the Exchange Act permits the SEC to issue reports of investigation. And the SEC uses this tool from time to time as kind of a soft way to, to, to almost do rulemaking, but to say, look, we're not going to sue this guy, but he, he, here's all the things he did wrong, and you know, the public is unnoticed that the next time we see one of these, we will sue you. And that's, that's in essence what they did here. And that report uh, clarified that uh, a company-sponsored social media site can be a recognized channel of distribution uh, for regulation FD purposes. And they, they cited a 2008 uh, set of guidelines that the commission issued. Um, even that seems like ancient history now, but, but that was geared more towards the use of company websites. So you know, instead of doing a press release, or uh, can you can you just post it to your website? And um, you know, the answer is, look, if it's if it's broad, if it's not exclusionary, if uh, if it's a recognized channel distribution, meaning people know to go there for information, then, then sure it works. And the same is true of social media. Um, um, you know, the, 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 the non-exclusionary factor was one of the reasons why, in this case, Facebook was a problem because you actually had to sort of friend or unfriend um, 
the, the CEO, and that meant that you couldn't just automatically uh, be included. Um, and the report cautioned that an individual corporate officer's personal social media page generally will not be a permissible channel for Reg FD purposes. So it's okay for the company to uh, release information under social media, again, if it meets some of these other criteria, but it's generally never going to work for this, the CEO or the CFO or some other person to have their own personal uh, stream. Uh, one other interesting issue that came out of this was um, uh, uh, what do you do with Twitter uh, and what do you do with other types of products that might limit you to the number of characters you can include, um, particularly if you know, the company is, is talking about an earnings release and they usually want to do their forward-looking statements disclaimer or they're doing a securities offering and you're required to have a certain legend under rule uh, about the nature of the offering or similar, you might be in a, uh, talking about a pro preliminary proxy statement that you're not yet seeking votes on. What do you, what do, you do with all these lengthy boilerplate disclaimers the SEC requires? And the SEC said, well, if there's no limit on the characters, um, you're, you, you should put the full disclaimer. But if there is a limit on characters, you can hyperlink. And so um, uh, to the extent you're using Twitter or other sorts of social media you can, um, uh, that, that do have a limit on the number of characters, you can, you can hyperlink to whatever disclaimers you're supposed to use. Um, moving right along, another another topic that's been in the news a lot is, is the one uh, around insider trading and uh, so-called Rule 10b-51 trading plans. Uh, 10b-51 plans uh, uh, come under a rule by the same name, and uh, this was this was a set of rules the SEC adopted several years ago that allows a, a, a trader to establish an affirmative defense to insider trading charges, and it's important that it's an affirmative defense and not a safe harbor. But it allows you to establish an affirmative defense to the extent that you've got a, a written plan that lays out uh, mechanically, whether through a formula or some other mechanical process, how trading can be conducted on your behalf by a third party. You adopt that plan when you don't have uh, material non-public information, sort of goes into effect, um, you, you know, takes away the trader's authority to, 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 to control the, the trading. It's, you know, that, that trading is vested in the hands of a third party, usually a broker who's applying their formula. And uh, the idea is you're not making a trade in the possession of material non-public information because you established the plan in advance, and when the trade's actually made, you didn't direct it. Um, it was done under your sort of standing instructions. These have become very popular. Um, uh, uh, most brokers offer uh, various versions of this to their customers. It's very popular with, with uh, officers and directors of public companies. Um, uh, some companies permit them. Some companies don't. Um, uh, companies themselves will even use these as part of their own buyback program so that you, know, you, you take away the theoretical charge that the company itself is engaging in insider trading. Uh, you know, of course, from time to time, these plans uh, have been the subject of abuse. Um, the, probably the most famous example was uh, Countrywide Financial, which had a lot of problems. The CEO there, Angelo Mazzillo, had uh, at any given time several plans outstanding. I think he had four at one time that he put in place in three months. Uh, he was frequently amending them. He was frequently changing the terms. He was frequently suspending trading or trading outside of the plan. And the SEC looked at all that and said, well, this is not really like you have a plan at all. Um, so um, we're going to charge you with insider trading anyway. Um, from time to time, the, the news media will also analyze trades that were made under these kinds of plans, um, and they'll find correlations with earnings releases or other things and, and, and uh, claim that something nefarious is afoot. Um, so you recently have had a lot of institutional investor groups saying that we need some additional guidelines around what these plans can and can't do. Um, you know, A couple of the things that they've been urging are um, a, a greater cooling off period between when you adopt a plan and when you start trading under it. You know, market practice now uh, varies anywhere from a few days or for a few weeks to, to a month or two before a plan goes into effect. It, it tends to be a week or two before you start trading. Uh, I've seen it shorter. I've seen it longer. Uh, some of the institutional investors have said, no, this should be at least 90 days. I think that's, that's pretty far out, but it's certainly one, one thing that, that companies could consider. And also suggesting that um, the board and management have greater oversight of these plans. Um, you know, practice at companies is all over the place in terms of the ones that do permit them. Uh, of the companies that do permit them, uh, sometimes they'll require that the general counsel or someone of that, that caliber has to sign off on a plan before it's adopted. 
Um, uh, but even then, that's that's not uniform. And and uh, in terms of uh, the types of trading guidelines, you know, there, there aren't a lot. And I think a lot of these groups are suggesting that boards should get more involved in these issues, should have more discrete requirements, uh, you know, in terms of what the trading instructions can look like, the volume of trades, the frequency of trades, uh, the size of trades, those sorts of things, and require greater oversight by compliance professionals. Um, you know, some of our clients are taking that guidance to heart. Others aren't. Um, I think that's an individual call, but it's certainly good for you all to know that that these issues are out there. Um, we've got uh, one more polling question. Um, does your company permit 10B51 plans? Obviously, if you're not publicly traded, that's not really relevant. Um, but if you are, you can check yes or no. And um, let's see what the results are. Uh, again, about about 50/50, um, which which is consistent with what my experience has been with our own clients. Uh, the topic of proxy advisors is one that I think continues to uh, 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 be on the forefront uh, of governance issues. Uh, these are groups that advise institutional investors uh, on, on a host of issues, but but generally as it concerns voting uh, uh, shares in public companies. And this this comes out of some rulings in the 80s and 90s by the uh, Department of Labor on the ERISA side and the SEC on the investment advisor side that have led most investors to, uh, of the institutional variety to conclude that they have to vote every share they own. Um, and if you have a portfolio with several thousand companies in it, you know there's no way that one person can go and read all those proxy statements and make an informed decision. So in essence, what a lot of these investors have done is outsource the voting decision. Um, and that, of course, has led to complaints about the proxy advisors themselves. There are probably four or five of them that are in the marketplace. Uh, it's really there's really two that are the largest, ISS and Glass Lewis. And of those two, ISS um, has a 70 or 80 percent market share. They don't uh, exactly report <laughs> that kind of information, but that's that's what most folks have gleaned. Um, uh, in, in light of some of these concerns, the SEC staff recently has, has issued some guidance that said, look, maybe there's some situations where you don't have to vote those shares. Maybe that takes some of the pressure off using proxy advisors. Uh, and also uh, another complaint, particularly against ISS, uh, because ISS has a whole separate subsidiary that does corporate governance consulting. There's a perception that um, if, unless you hire their, their corporate governance consultants, the folks on the other side of the house that do their voting recommendations will will view that negatively. Now, of course, ISS denies that that's the way their business model works. Um, uh, I think a lot of our clients might say uh, otherwise, but um, in, in any event, um, the, the ISS and Glass Lewis have sort of responded to this attention in, in, in really different ways. Glass Lewis has basically thumbed its nose and said, look, we don't care what you all think. We're going to keep running our system like we want to. And it's sure it's a black box, but you know that's, that's the nature of being a business. Everybody has their own proprietary methods, and we prefer to keep ours proprietary. I think ISS has taken a somewhat different track and uh, has at least tried to uh, – be more transparent. If they've got surveys, they have working groups. You can um, uh, now comment on some of your uh, a report before it gets filed. You know whether they take that into account or not is a is another question. Um, one of the things that ISS just did was uh, they announced a new data verification portal for equity compensation plans. And uh, you know one of the biggest criticisms is that they don't understand executive compensation. And you know. Some of that may be true. Some of that may be companies are a bit opaque in their CDNA discussion. Um, but there's a lot of wringing of hands over ISS misinterpreting uh, the way uh, executive compensation is described, and that in turn informs their voting recommendations. Uh, so they've opened it up and said, "Look, you can now you can now get in there, and we'll give you a couple of days, or maybe it's just 24 hours, depending on who you are. Um, notice uh, so that you can get in and, and provide us with additional information that will help inform our report. So that's a new product. Most companies haven't used it because they're um, uh, haven't been through the proxy cycle yet, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll probably see it used a lot in the in, in the coming days." We're going to move into some enforcement cases. I've just put up here on the uh, on the slide briefly what what the elements of a claim under 10b-5 are uh, for the SEC to bring in any fraud charge. Um, 
uh, it requires, you know, in particular that the person have scienter, which is either knowledge or, or recklessness. Um, there's a separate anti-fraud provision under the Securities Act of 1933 that more or less tracks 10b-5. It's cool. It's it's provision called Section 17a. Uh, 17a-2 and a-3 though allow the SEC to bring charges under a negligence theory. So that's sometimes trotted out. And I, as I noted on the slide, there's some differences between what the SEC has to prove and the additional elements that a private plaintiff would have to prove in an action. So let's talk about some cases that the SEC has brought recently. Um, the first one I'll mention it just w was in the last couple of weeks. It was a, a beneficial ownership sweep. And most of you are familiar with the, the Section 13 and Section 16 reporting obligations for 5% and 10% shareholders and, and uh, also for officers and directors under Section 16. And the SEC um, used some uh, uh, quantitative data analysis uh, across the Edgar database to look for, you know, frankly, folks that have been uh, tardy in their filings. And they ended up focusing on over 30 different defendants. Some of them were public companies. Some of them were individual officers and directors. Some of them were individual shareholders. Some of them were institutional shareholders. Uh, some of these companies were brand names. Some of the investors were brand names that you'd, you'd recognize. And they all had missed um, uh, either a Section 13 or a Section 16 report. In, in some cases, just a matter of days. Most of the time, though, it was weeks or months or even years, and there were some instances where no filing had been made at all. And uh, the SEC brought the charges against each of them, uh, and you know, most, uh, with the exception of one, um, defendants settled uh, and, and paid a fine and, and agreed to cease and desist from doing this in the future. Um, I think what's what's notable is that the SEC charged several public companies for causing violations by their uh, Section 16 insiders. Um, and so that comes out of the practice that most companies have of preparing their forms 3, 4, and 5 for their officers and directors. It's, you've got two business days now to file them. That's been the case since Sarbanes-Oxley back in 2002. And it's, it's, it's not something that an individual could tackle on their own. It's a very technical area. So just about every company offers a service to their insiders that they'll do those reports for you. Um, and the SEC found that several of these public companies were, were negligent uh, in not getting these things filed on time. And they thus charged them also with causing the violation by the by their insiders and causing is a it's like aiding and abetting uh, more or less, but it's it's something that could be done uh, in the administrative context. And again, unlike aiding and abetting, that requires at least reckless conduct. The SEC can charge you for negligent conduct um, uh, in the administrative context. Um, and then finally, in, in one of these cases, the SEC determined that uh, the company's proxy statement was deficient. You know, there, there's that little paragraph that's usually on the last page of every proxy statement about uh, compliance with Section 16 reports, and that's where you have to list all the ones that the company knows were filed late. This particular company was uh, the, did not accurately report that information. Their CEO had had been uh, late on numerous occasions, and they did not disclose that. And the staff took the position that um, uh, that rendered the proxy statement materially misleading, um, uh, and that one's being litigated, um, uh, at least in part. Get into a couple of uh, accounting cases that are also of recent vintage. Um, the first one is a company called JDA Software, and, and the real the real lesson here is that they they had deficient internal controls and they did not properly recognize and report revenue uh, under a software license they had. Uh, the SEC went through and ticked out a laundry list of deficiencies with their internal controls that had the effect of misstating revenue uh, and it actually led to a restatement. Uh, and uh, JDA settled an administrative action that it violated the books and records and reporting requirements and the internal control provisions. Um, it also agreed to cease and desist from future violations, and it paid a penalty. Um, no anti-fraud charges, and the executives were not charged. Uh, I think that's an addition, that's an interesting contrast to another software company um, that engaged in a different kind of uh, uh, revenue recognition issue, uh, Saba Software. This one was was based on two former executives that that decided that uh, they would work with uh, a number of their uh, uh, ex expatriate and offsite. Um, uh, consultants to falsify their timesheets uh, so that they could meet their budget uh, guidelines in terms of compensation and uh, those sorts of things. 
And the, the, the net result was that by turning in these misleading and, and incorrect timesheets, they weren't appropriately uh, accounting for the cost of labor and, and uh, uh, recognizing revenue from some of their consulting arrangements. Um, that led them to accelerate re- revenue, and it led them to restate uh, their financial statements. There, the company paid a, a larger penalty, uh, not only for books and records and internal controls, but also for, for any fraud. Um, the executives themselves were also charged, and they paid penalties. I think this one's interesting because the SEC also used its power under Section 304 of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act uh, to claw back compensation uh, uh, from the uh, CEO, uh, and that provision allows, really in a no-fault situation, uh, the CEO and the CFO are, can be compelled to repay to the company um, any bonuses uh, or other incentive compensation they receive during a period in which there's a restatement. Um, uh, there was some litigation a few years back in terms of whether that no-fault requirement was constitutional or not, and the SEC won at the district court and the defendant after that settled, so it's never really been up to an appellate court. but. Uh, it's a it's a tool the SEC uses. I think the commission has been criticized because they they use it uh, sporadically, and there's not really clear standards as to when it happens. But this is something that all CEOs and CFOs are currently subject to. And as we'll talk about in a minute, there's a Dodd Frank um, regulation on the horizon that would apply that to a much broader class of executives. Um, Meyer Hoffman McCann, this is a, an accounting case, uh, or really it's an independence case against a, an accounting firm. And it's somewhat unusual because the, the accounting firm has, has a parent that's publicly traded. That's, that's unusual um, for accounting firms. And it's not technically a parent. It's uh, for professional liability reasons. It's, it's done through a complicated networking and affiliation agreement. But, but the SEC deemed it to be essentially a parent-subsidiary type of relationship. And that, um, that accounting firm had an audit client, um, uh, TradeBot, who's a high-frequency trader, they're a registered broker-dealer, and uh, TradeBot was regularly trading in the securities of this publicly traded parent company. Um, uh, as you read the SEC's order, uh, it was somewhat critical of Meyer Hoffman because they uh, are alleged to not have understood the accounting independence rules. Um, uh, when the, the technical partner was consulted, he was unavailable, he was on vacation and not reachable, and, and some of the other folks, I guess, cracked the books, and at least according to the SEC's order, uh, got the interpretation wrong, we're looking at the wrong rules. Um, uh, uh, eventually, the SEC charged both TradeBot and the accounting firm. Uh, TradeBot settled, um, uh, but the accounting firm is, is, is fighting this, so we'll, we'll see where that goes. But it just goes to show you that this is another message case that the independence rules are on the books, and you know the, the SEC suspects that there are probably more violations than, than they actually litigate, but from time to time, they, they pick one of these and they, they make a message out of it. Uh, a couple of more accounting cases. Um, this one, uh, Regions Bank, uh, involved, uh, uh, again, senior bank officers who intentionally misclassified loans. This is a common issue with uh, banks of financial institutions. The SEC frequently seeks uh, charges for, for irregularities with uh, loan loss allowances and similar uh, accounting entries. Um, here, the SEC charged both the company um, and the executives. This is notable because the company entered into a deferred prosecution agreement, uh, you know, which the SEC has started doing over the last several years. They're they're not too different than the one used in the criminal context, and they basically say, look, we'll, we'll we the company covenant to do all these things uh, and and pay that fine that you're going to collect anyway, and but you won't charge us. And the SEC says, all right, we'll monitor it, and if you uh, if you hold up your end of the bargain, then we won't charge you. Um, so they kind of have their cake and eat it too. Compare that one to, uh, to ACS. Um, this one involved a different kind of accounting irregularity. What was interesting about this case is that when you read the SEC's order and press release, they, it, it's really a, a house of horrors uh, against this company um, and, and all the, the allegedly terrible things that the CEO and CFO did to, uh, uh, you know, in essence, misstate revenue. Um, but what was notable is that the executives settled to violating, you know, books and records charges and disgorgement and penalties, but there's no anti-fraud charges brought against them. And that led to uh, a rare public dissent by one of the commissioners, again, Commissioner Aguilar, um, who, who publicly aired a criticism that I think a lot of folks in the defense bar have, which is if you're saying that all these things were so bad, then you should have charged these guys with fraud. 
Um, if on the other hand, you, you're saying these things are so bad, but there is no fraud, then maybe we shouldn't have charged them at all. And I mean, I think Commissioner Hagelauer has taken the approach that we should have charged them with fraud. But that's that, that's a common complaint that that the defense bar has, and it I think goes to show you that you know with a lot of these cases. Uh, there's always been books and records charges. You know, those generally uh, are strict liability offenses. They don't require the proving of any wrongdoing, um, and they can be a powerful tool that the SEC uses in, in policing the accounting practices of public companies. Um, you know, the SEC is not the only enforcer out there. There are a lot of other uh, agencies that, that, in one way or another, enforce uh, either state securities laws or other other standards. Um, one that's been somewhat active recently is the New York Attorney General. Um, he is empowered to use the Martin Act, which uh, dates to the 1920s, predates the the federal securities laws. Uh, it was passed at a time to basically fill that gap because there were no federal securities laws up until 1933. Um, and uh, what's interesting about it is it's an anti-fraud statute that has no knowledge requirement. So in, in theory, all, all these violations are strict liability violations. And the New York Attorney General has been very active in recent years um, you know, through several different administrations um, in pursuing Martin Act violations for disclosure issues by public companies. Um, you know, The first generation of these cases was around climate change disclosure. More recently, we've seen it around hydraulic fracturing. Um, and what they do is they, they will settle with companies if the companies agree to make uh, enhanced disclosures. And I've listed some of them on the slide along uh, of the types of disclosures they're making. Um, some companies get these subpoenas and they, they can't settle quickly enough with, with the New York Attorney General. There, there are other companies that have been fighting this for years. Um, and uh, uh, again, this is an area where hopefully you never receive one of these, but they're out there and, and um, uh, these, these can be difficult cases. Uh, uh. We do have a lot of lawyers on the phone, so I will talk just briefly about um, up the ladder reporting. You know, th this is under Section 307 of, of uh, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, and I guess before I get into that, I'll just more broadly step back and say the SEC has rules of practice for attorneys who practice before it, and the SEC's notion of appearing and practicing is really anyone that contributes to the preparation of a filing with the SEC. So it's not just your traditional in-house securities lawyer or the, you know, the law firm, whether it's Hunton Williams or some other firm that you use for your SEC disclosures, but any lawyer who aids in the preparation of report, the SEC will deem to be appearing or practicing before him. So if you're an environmental lawyer and you, you review that environmental risk factor, or if you're a tax lawyer and you review a tax discussion, or you're in some other um, uh, regulatory practice and you, you help prepare you know, two sentences that go into a 10Q or a 10K, uh, the SEC views you as appearing and practicing before them. And these rules are separate and apart from uh, state bar rules that may be out there. They're separate apart from state bar rules that may deal with uh, reporting illegal activity or fraud by your clients. Uh, under SOX 307, uh, th th there's a detailed mechanism that's laid out, uh, in essence, to create a whistleblowing mechanism for attorneys. That if you're an attorney and you, you see something that's amiss, you're required to contact either the CLO, um, being, being the chief legal officer, or its equivalent, or the CEO, and then they have an obligation to conduct an inquiry. And if they do that and they find no wrongdoing, they have to report it to the attorney. Uh, otherwise, they have to keep investigating and remediate it. Um, and if the reporting attorney is unsatisfied, then he's allowed to take it up the ladder and go to the audit committee or, or, or the full board of directors. Um, you know, the, these occasions are rare, but when they happen, they can be very uh, dicey, to say the least, um, and can be very difficult to resolve. Uh, one thing that the SEC did not require, uh, ultimately, when they, when they proposed some rules around this, they had a mechanism for a so-called noisy withdrawal, where the reporting attorney you know, could actually go public with his his or her concerns and describe the conduct in detail, and uh, that provision never got acted on. It, you know, it's 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 still technically in proposal stage, but 10, 12 years later, I think it's safe to say that uh, it's not going anywhere. But these issues can still be very difficult, and you have to square these with your obligations under your state bar regulations. And um, you know, if you're someone like me who's admitted in several states. The crime fraud exception is different in different states, and you may have an obligation in one state and a prohibition in another. So it can be, these can be tricky. Um, and you know, if you find yourself having to deal with one of these, you should probably get some help and not not try and deal with it yourself. Um, 
On the topic of whistleblowers, this has become very popular also, um, uh, more so under the Dodd-Frank Act because there's, a, there's actually a bounty mechanism that I'll talk about in a second. But um, there's also some mechanisms in the Sarbanes-Oxley Act that, that deal with whistleblowers. Um, 301 requires you to have a procedure uh, established by the Audit Committee for, for handling and recording uh, 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 complaints about accounting and internal controls. Um, most companies have, have either outsourced this or set up an internal compliance system where there's sort of a 1-800 number you can call or there's another anonymous system where you can submit an email or, um, and you know, these have become pretty standard part of the public company compliance. Um, that works with Section 806 of Sarbanes-Oxley Act, which has an actual anti-retaliation provision. Uh, and it protects whistleblowers who come forward with evidence of corporate fraud um, from from being disciplined. Uh, to go to, to avail yourself of that mechanism, that requires an employee to go through a very convoluted OSHA administrative process that's subject to multiple layers of appeal. Um, and but it does have some some from the employee's perspective uh, nice remedies, which include reinstatement, back pay, damages, and, and costs of litigation. What really, though, has been getting a lot of attention um, is a similar provision in the Dodd-Frank Act. Um, this one also includes an anti-retaliation mechanism, a reinstatement, allows you to get two times back pay, also lets you to get litigation costs and attorney fees. Um, it does not require you to go through the um, OSHA process. Um, and it also empowers the SEC to, to make payments of bounties of anywhere from 10 to 30 percent of the SEC's recovery uh, in an enforcement matter. So if you come forward with original information, uh, which, which, which is a defined term, uh, the SEC successfully brings a lawsuit and they collect at least a million dollars, um, and you can be eligible for anywhere from 10 to 30 percent of that. Um, the uh, SEC has brought an action recently uh, against the company that uh, is alleged to have retaliated against the whistleblower. Um, the director of the SEC's whistleblower office over the summer um, made some waves when he uh, suggested the SEC would be seeking to um, uh, somehow penalize or, or discipline in-house lawyers that drafted employment agreements that, that violated the spirit of the rules, open questions to what that means or if it's something that even has the authority or the agency has the authority to do, but it did send some shockwaves through the uh, in-house bar. And just a few weeks ago, the SEC announced really it was a record award. Um, the whistleblower is going to receive over $30 million, uh, which was twice the size of the, the record before that. Um, there have only been 15 awards to date. Um, I think this one was notable because it included – uh, the whistleblower was overseas somewhere, and it, you know, it reinforces that these rules are global in their application. Um, I think it's also notable because uh, we know from a press release by the whistleblower's law firm that the whistleblower had counsel, and um, you know, th this is a growth area uh, for, for both plaintiff-side employment firms and plaintiff-side uh, securities litigation firms. Both have been building out their whistleblower practices uh, to, to try and um, uh, find clients who presumably they'll, they'll take a percentage of whatever the whistleblower gets. Um, and it does put stress on your internal compliance systems. I mean, most companies set up these, these internal systems to require or permit reporting of, uh, of irregularities so that the company learns about it immediately and can take prompt action to, to correct it. Uh, if you set up a system as the SEC has where you know, you're, in essence, offering money for folks to bypass that process, and in fact, in this, this record award, the, the SEC's order criticized the whistleblower for, for not coming forward too fa uh, fast enough, you know, that creates some perverse incentives. Um, and and you know, our clients, uh, public companies, are struggling with this in some ways. Um, you know, what I say is the best way to deal with this is just have a credible system. Uh, there's a lot of evidence and research that shows that most whistleblowers are reluctant to do that. They do it only as a last resort because they don't have confidence in the internal system. They don't believe it's credible. They don't believe it's trustworthy. If you set up an internal system for tracking this kind of information and, and dealing with whistleblowers in a respectful and, and trustworthy way, um, the thought and the hope is that they won't see the need to go outside the organization and that they'll, they'll contribute to correcting it internally. I'll conclude. I see our time starting to run a little bit late. Um, I'll conclude with just a couple of slides on 
uh, activism. Um, you know, this this has become uh, a big issue for companies. Uh, in the old days, it was only certain companies that were targeted, um, but nowadays, any company is, is subject to. Uh, hedge fund activism or activism by other sophisticated investors. This is different than uh, the kind of activism that we talked about earlier under 14A8. Um, th these are folks that actually have real money. They have real investments in companies. They're looking to affect fundamental change, um, whether it's replacing the board, whether it's putting the company in play to be sold, whether it's hiring a new CEO, whether it's splitting the company up or doing a dividend or some other significant transaction. Um, uh, they tend to be oriented on short-termism. Um, but uh, as we've seen in some recent proxy fights involving some really big companies, um, you know, all, all but all but the largest public companies are uh, no longer immune to this sort of activity. So um, there are a number of things you can do to guard against it, to protect against it. Obviously, uh, you know all, all the good old-fashioned legal defenses, whether it's a shareholder rights plan or protective bylaws, etc., can uh, if, a prop, if, if adopted under appropriate circumstances and consistent with the board's fiduciary duties, um, you know, can, can provide some defense. You know, a big part of this is, is following your shareholder base, understanding who your shareholders are, uh, understanding what issues they may have, being proactive in addressing those issues, keeping the board in the loop. Um, you know, we say have an emergency response plan. If you do get a letter across the <laughs> transom, so to speak, from one of these investors saying we want to meet, um, uh, it's often a good idea to meet, and it's a good idea to be prepared. And chances are they're going to roll out their vision for the company, and uh, it may include various strategic changes. We want to spin this off, or we want to divest this, or we want to sell that, or we want to dividend that. And you need to anticipate those kinds of changes. You need to have reasons why the company thinks that they're not wise. And um, you want to have that conversation in a way that's uh, positive. Everything you say can, will be used against you. You know, the, these folks will take minutes of meetings. They'll, they'll publish letters of the company's issues, so you have to be very careful. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, engaging these activists is probably the best way to do it. Um, uh, you, and uh, you need to be prepared. That's, that's the other thing we tell our clients. Uh, you know, if you get one of these letters and you're scrambling to respond, then it's probably too late. Uh, you, you know, it's really more helpful to have a whole plan in place. You know, have your law firm lined up, have your professional uh, advisors lined up, have your financial advisor lined up, have your PR firm lined up, run some drills, you know, talk, talk about these issues in advance, anticipate what, what activists might be saying, you know, do, do that own kind of introspective look, look at your balance sheet. You know, well-run companies are doing this already, but, um, you know, if you've got a lot of cash on the balance sheet and you haven't declared a dividend in years and you haven't done any buybacks, that's low-hanging fruit for an activist to come say, you know what, you ought to be sharing that money with your shareholders. So um, uh, be prepared and, and be prepared to engage. And with the, um, the last slide here, I'll, uh, I'll just peer into my crystal ball a little bit. Um, we've gone through in the last hour or so a lot of SEC rules, um, but the nature of all regulators is that they want to pass more <laughs> rules. And um, in particular, the SEC has, has still outstanding mandates under both the Dodd-Frank Act and the Jobs Act uh, to write new rules um, uh, under the Dodd-Frank Act. Which is four years old now. You know, the SEC has only completed about 50% of the rules that's required to, to write, uh, uh, depending on how you measure that. And, and the statistics are about the same for the Jobs Act. So what I think the SEC is going to focus on in the short to medium term to, to try and keep clearing out some of those rules. Well, there's a lot of rules that don't apply directly to public companies, um, but ones that I think the SEC is going to focus on first and foremost is getting the CEO pay ratio rules done. That was proposed about a year ago. This is a very controversial proposal that requires the company to measure um, the, 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 the average compensation of the uh, median employee and then to uh, c compare that in the form of a ratio to what the CEO makes and make disclosure about it. A lot of political pressure on the SEC to get this rule done. Um, I think we'll probably see that happen this fall. I think it's going to be a split 3-2 vote. I think it's going to be very ugly, and I expect that companies are not going to be satisfied with what the rule says. Um, uh, that's not the only executive compensation rule that's out there, though. There are three other ones that Dodd-Frank requires the SEC to get done where they've, they've not even proposed. Uh, I think we'll probably see an effort to at least get those rules proposed. The first is the pay for versus performance rule. This is under 953 of Dodd-Frank, and it 
basically requires disclosure around um, uh, you know what what the executive was paid versus the actual financial performance of the company, and, and requires you to put in uh, some some at least in theory require you to put some narrative disclosure around that. We'll see what the actual rules say when the SEC gets that done. Uh, another one is the compensation clawback rule. Um, we talked a little bit about this earlier when we mentioned 304 Sarbanes-Oxley. There, that just applies to the CFO and the CEO. This provision of Dodd-Frank under 954, the Dodd-Frank Act would require uh, actually the stock exchange to pass listing rules, um, but the net effect is that um, companies would require to have a procedure for a similar kind of clawback if there's uh, an accounting restatement. Um, for basically all executive officers, uh, not just the CEO. So, and um, finally, um, uh, the uh, hedging disclosure rule under 955 of the Dodd-Frank Act uh, would require uh, companies to disclose what their policy is if they have one on uh, the ability of officers and directors to hedge the company's stock, you know, whether it's through a collar or a prepay forward or some other uh, swap or equity um, uh, hedge. Uh, the SEC, I think, is going to continue to look at disclosure reform. J just on Friday, there was a speech about that. This is <laughs> sort of the once-in-a-generational opportunity for the SEC to rethink its Regulation SK and Regulation SX and some of its other rules um, and, and perhaps bring them forward and modernize them, and, and not just the content of the rules, but also the, the way they're delivered. I think we'll see some traction on that this fall, uh, at least probably some so-called concept releases on SX and SK. Uh, you know, in terms of proxy advisors, the next point, I don't think we're going to see much more going on there. Uh, I mentioned earlier today the, uh, the, the staff guidance on that, the staff legal bulletin. I think that's probably as far as the commission will go on that topic for a while. Um, but let's continue to monitor what the proxy advisors are doing, and uh, continue to keep the SEC aware if if, if there are if there are problems. Uh, we've talked about conflict minerals. Um, depending on where the DC Circuit goes, the SEC is going to have to do something to tweak its rules. Uh, I think um, there's another rule that was thrown out by it didn't even go to the DC Circuit. It was done at the District Court on resource extraction. This only applied to uh, a small, small number of, of companies in the uh, extractive industries that were similar to conflict minerals required to make all sorts of uh, detailed sort of shaming disclosures about their royalty practices overseas. Um, that was stricken on First Amendment and other grounds as well. Um, uh, the SEC has actually been sued by an NGO to rewrite those rules. Um, you know, Suppose though they're coming down the pipeline and that will moot the litigation, but we'll see where that goes. Um, under the Jobs Act, uh, the SEC is required to complete some rules on crowdfunding, um, which have been out there. Uh, probably not something that's particularly interesting to uh, mature public companies because they wouldn't really be able to use it anyway, but it could be an exciting way for startup companies to raise capital without you know, using the traditional intermediaries that um, you know, folks have to use when they're raising money. Um, also, so-called Regulation A+, plus, I think, is, is due for um, uh, some, some adoption. The SEC proposed rules, they haven't really gone anywhere. This would allow sort of quasi-limited public offerings up to $50 million, uh, which I think could be a powerful tool for, for uh, not necessarily startup companies, but companies looking to move to the next level and, and raise more significant funds than, than you might do in a, in a, in a seeding round. Um, uh, two more topics that have been somewhat controversial. One is, is public company disclosure of their political activities and their uh, uh, trade association support. I um, uh, I don't think the SEC is going to go anywhere on that. It's a very uh, politically charged issue, no pun intended. But I think that's one that, that uh, the SEC rightfully is just going to stay away from, uh, given the potential political fallout for that. And finally, um, we talked a little bit earlier about the, um, uh, the enforcement action involving violations of uh, the Section 13 and 16 reporting obligations. Separately, there's been a call um, from from some uh, public companies and from some that represent public companies to shorten the window in which a Schedule 13D is due. Right now, it's it's you know, subject to a lot of exceptions, and um, but basically, it's it's the first one's due within 10 days of you crossing the the 5% threshold. That may have made sense in the late 60s when the rules came out. But a lot of folks have been saying we should shorten that period uh, in the modern era. 
Um, and of course, you have a lot of investors saying, well, we like that first mover advantage, and we like being able to at least have 10 days where we can execute a proprietary strategy before everybody gets on the bandwagon and follows us. So there's been a lot of kind of pros and cons to, to making that change. I think uh, nothing's going to happen <laughs> given that debate. In fact, just recently, Commissioner Gallagher gave some interviews with the press where he said he doesn't expect the commission to get around to doing anything on that. So um, if you were hoping or expecting those rules to change anytime soon, I, I, I don't think that's going to happen. The SEC is going to be busy with, with a lot of other things. Um, just looking in the uh, box now as we finish our, our slide presentation, um, see if we had any questions. I don't see any that have come in during the course of the uh, presentation. Uh, I'll give everyone just a second, uh, realizing that our time is short, to, uh, to pose any if you have them. If you anyone should have any questions, please type them in the Q&A box. We do have polling questions that you will need to stay on and answer, and we do apologize that we have ran over today. So we're going to move on to CLE polling questions. Scott, do you have anything else before we move on? Nope, I think, I think we're in good shape. Perfect. All right, we'll go ahead and quickly do the polling question. Please rate today's webinar. Our next CLE polling question, please rate the overall quality. Also, while you're answering the questions, you can also notice in the resource box you can download some files, our speaker bio, the presentation slides, the CLE survey, and the sign-in sheet if you're participating as a group. Pulling question three for CLE, please rate the written material. And our last polling question, please rate today's instructor. One being the lowest, five being the highest. We thank everyone for taking time out of your busy schedules and joining us for our webinar today. I will leave um, the resource list up for a little bit longer so you can download anything. When you received your reminder notice, all these same documents are listed in there just in case um, you need to log off real quickly. You can get all these same documents in the reminder notice that was sent out. The presentation slides will also be sent out in your certificate participation email, so you'll also receive it there also. Again, we thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules and joining our webinar today. We also thank Scott Kempel, partner with Hunton Williams and CT Corporation for putting on today's webinar. Thank you, everyone. Just a reminder, CLA certificate participation emails will be sent out within this week. And then also, if you're requesting CLA in California or New York, your certificate will be sent to you within 30 days. Thank you very much for participating.